Thanks for coming along. So we're pleased to invite uh, or receive uh, Dr. Matteo Saita from uh, Nanyang Technological University. Um, it's about the map lecture series. We've done a few of, and um, now we've now we're back in person. We can see people in 3D, which is wonderful. Uh, so I met Matteo on Twitter. Yep. Um, and it's a good example of why you should promote your work on social media. Um, whatever you think of it personally at the time, if you just throw it out there, um, you never know what can happen. Um, so, Matteo is an uh, assistant professor at Nanyang, and he holds positions at two, two separate departments, um, as you put here. So, you're an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, and a material scientist. Uh, actually, uh, so the first affiliation is mechanical and aerospace, and then I have courtesy appointments in the other two which means that I don't do anything there. <laughs> well, you can put it on slides. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, th I think I sent around a load of information um, about what the talk will be, but I'll let you introduce it. So the floor is yours, Matthew. Sure, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you all for coming to my uh, seminar today. And thanks again, Ben, for uh, you know coordinating with me, arranging everything. It's, uh, it's been lovely so far, and I look forward to a further discussion later on today. It's also refreshing to finally be able to be here in person and deliver a seminar in person as opposed to, or to real people as opposed to Zoom avatars um, for a change. So uh, today I'm gonna talk about microstructure heterogeneity in metal additive manufacturing. And I'll tell you what I mean by um, microstructure heterogeneity, what, what, what I'm referring to basically. And I will also tell you why I call it a double-edged sword. So I'm sure that Everyone here has heard of additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Probably most of the people, I don't know, um, but does anybody work uh, on additive manufacturing here? Right, cool. So presumably the other people that do not work on additive manufacturing have at least heard of AM or 3D printing, at the very least because of the massive uh, coverage that this technology gets uh, through social media, for instance, uh, uh, but also in the press. Not long ago, for example, uh, Twitter was crawling with images taken by the Perseverance rover on Mars, which I personally believe or think um, embodies sort of the triumph of additive uh, over conventional manufacturing. Some of the parts of this rover were made by additive manufacturing, could only be made by additive manufacturing because of their complex design. Now, despite of um, these successful stories uh, um, and also the, the fame that this technology has, uh, the applications that currently rely on, on parts that are produced by additive processes uh, are scarce and typically restricted to industries with large capital, such as the aerospace indeed. And one of the main reasons for that, I think, is that additive processes are inherently variable. There is some uh, intrinsic variability in the additive process, uh, and this variability translates um, into parts with variable mechanical performance. And so this problem here, I have a prototypical example of that problem here. So this is something we've done at NTU. That's over there a block of Inconel 718, a nickel-based superalloy extensively used in the aerospace, which we produce by this additive uh, technique called directed energy deposition, or DED. And after production, we cut it open and then we image the internal structure, the microstructure of this material using some sophisticated microscopy techniques that give you these colorful and beautiful maps. If you don't know what techniques I'm talking about or how to read these maps, it's okay. I'll tell you more about that later. But for now, you can appreciate how chaotic this microstructure looks like. I call this the Frankenstein sample because it looks like a mad material scientist just stitched together different pieces of Inconel 718 in completely arbitrary ways. I mean, just within the same sample that was processed, you know, within the same, you know, in, in, in one single go using the same process parameters, you can appreciate how different, you know, the size distribution, the morphology distribution, and the color distribution in this microstructure is, whatever the colors mean. And because microstructure dictates properties, you would not be surprised to know that we actually measure quite a bit of variability in mechanical properties, hardness, 10% uh, spread along Z, the build direction, we measure 20% variations of um, strength, yield strength, along X. Now, um, 
this problem here of microstructure heterogeneity scattered in, in mechanical properties is not only found in Inconel 718 when you process it with DED, of course. This is a beautiful piece of work that my collaborators at Sandia National Labs came up with uh, a few years back. Uh, and what they did here was to use laser particle fusion technology and 3D print an array, or well, arrays indeed, of nominally identical tensile specimens. This is stainless steel 316LM. And then they tested all of them. And then they compared the mechanical properties of these 3D printed specimens against those that you find in specimens that have been produced by conventional means. And sure enough, you see similar variability to what I was talking about earlier. Specifically, they reported 10% spread in elongation, 25% spread in strength. So similar problems, similar trends, uh, completely different material, completely different um, setup or added process. And my PhD student, in fact, at NTU, figured out that although they look the same, these parts are indeed different, except that the differences, again, are only visible when you look at the material at the microscopic scale. Same measurements as before, you compare these two balloons, you, you know, figure out that they are actually different. So this problem of microstructure heterogeneity is, uh, I think, a big one. I mean, picture this, you are the quality engineer that has to certify parts for flight, for instance, the parts that are on the rover, and you're facing this, you know, mechanical property variability. How can you possibly come up with a reliable, uh, you know, estimate of lifetime and performance of these parts? You can't. Um, the only option you're left with is to carry out extensive and expensive um, post-production treatments that aim at homogenizing these microstructures, right, and therefore making parts with consistent mechanical properties, which is a luxury that not all uh, industries can afford. And NASA did it for those parts that I showed you before, but some other companies opt for not using additive manufacturing. So because of this problem, we do a lot of different research activities in my group uh, that are motivated by, by this issue here. But today I'm going to focus on two of them. These are the two proverbial edges of the sword that I was talking about earlier. On the one hand, we don't want microstructure heterogeneity. It's bad because it casts uncertainty over part performance and lifetime. And so we, we thought, okay, how can we assess this microstructure heterogeneity more effectively um, both in academia and industry. Let me just go back real quick on this one. I haven't told you that whatever these techniques are, it took my PhD student 12 hours uh, to get this map. And if you imagine, you know, running these kind of things on all the samples that you're producing, although nominally identical, that becomes unsustainable, whether you're in industry or um, in academia. And so that's the first thing that I will show you today, um, an alternative technique that we came up with that hopefully helps in that regard. And then in the second part, I'll ask the question, uh, well, can we use, can we leverage microstructure heterogeneity as, as a good thing and integrate that aspect in our materials design paradigm so that we can come up with new materials uh, where we control the microstructure heterogeneity. Um, and hopefully these materials will exhibit exotic new properties that we might want to implement in our um, applications. All right, so those are the two parts. Um, I'm going to get started with the first one. Of course, if you have questions along the way, feel free to ask and interrupt it at, at any time. So here, I'm finally going to tell you something more about these colorful maps that most of you might have recognized. This is EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction. It's re, uh, referred to as the gold standard when it comes to characterization of polycrystalline solids. So, um, the hallmark of EBSD are these colorful maps. Uh, the colors here tell you how the atomic lattice is oriented in space. So, you know, by reading out the colors uh, and with reference to these maps uh, or legends, um, you can understand how, what the crystallographic orientation of the constituent grains or phases is in your solid. By the way, this is a pure um, nickel coin, polycrystalline nickel coin. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you a very short tutorial about EBSD, not because you need it, but because it's probably an overkill for this talk, but because I think you're going to be able to appreciate better the simplicity of what's coming next. So during EBSD, you have an electron beam that strikes your metal sample that is tilted at a 70 degree angle inside the scanning electron microscope. Uh, as the electrons undergo inelastic scattering in the crystal, some of these electrons, uh, well, they are scattered all around the place, and some of these electrons, by chance, 
will travel along directions that satisfy Bragg's condition, so they can travel long distance uh, across the vacuum chamber, heat a, um, um, a detector, produce these diffraction patterns, and then a computer you know, analyzes uh, these diffraction patterns and, and computes what the crystallographic orientation of the grain is. All right, so at NTU we figure out a way to get the same information but using an optical microscope instead, not a scanning electron microscope. So this technique is called directional reflectance microscopy, short DRM. And if you just compare these two maps visually, you will hardly see any differences. So we're using an optical microscope to get grain orientation information. At this point, you might be wondering two things. The first one is, how is it even possible? Because we know that optical microscopy has limited spatial resolution, which is restricted by the diffraction barrier of visible light. You can possibly measure crystallographic um, quantities directly, which is true, you're right. Um, but I'll show you in a couple of slides from now that we figure out a way to circumvent that limitation and guess what the colors are indirectly from an optical microscopy data set. The second thing you might be wondering is, okay, that sounds interesting, but why would we bother? I mean, uh, EBSD is the gold standard, I just told you, right? Uh, we've been using EBSD for you know, decades. Uh, why do we need yet another microstructure characterization technique? Well, there are different reasons why I think DRM could be helpful in the study of crystalline solids. And I have those three reasons here. So the first one is higher throughput. It took us six hours to get this map by EBSD, uh, but only 30 minutes to get the same information by DRM. Not only the data acquisition speed is um, faster than EBSD, we can always we can also um, image and, and gather microstructure information from much larger samples, right? I mean, uh, there is a physical limit to the size of the sample that you can stick into a scanning electron microscope, but in principle, there is no physical limit to what you can image by an optical camera. Um, and those two, together with the second point that I have here, which is low cost, I think are really um, interesting in the context of uh, assessing microstructure heterogeneity in 3D printed parts because, well, you can do it much faster and, and you can do it on much larger scales that are not amenable or you know, cannot be achieved by uh, EBSD. Uh, clearly, this is an obvious one, lower cost though. It, it, and, you know, DRM is based on an optical microscope, very simple, I'll show you to you in, in a couple of slides from now, um, as opposed to a scanning electron microscope. And really lower cost uh, basically translates in the possibility of having more people, both in industry and academia, that can have or can access uh, this kind of information. The last point that I have here is high accuracy. This is in relative terms, of course, because if you're thinking about an optical technique, that gathers information about the crystal orientation, um, three degrees may sound uh, not great, especially if you compare it to EBSD that has a sub-degree resolution. But again, in the context of additive, let's say you want to have a quick um, assessment of the microstructure of multiple samples that are nominally identical to fish out microstructure heterogeneities, or if you want to be able to image a real life size component uh, that you produce by AM, um, that's an option that, you know, and, and this is actually a, um, a, a accuracy that is, is good enough. I'll show it to you in a couple of slides. All right, first thing first. Uh, how does DRM work? Well, we need to etch the material. This is our nickel coin after we etched it using marbles reagent and up to the point where we see sparkling diamonds. I like to think that well, I like the idea that I'm here in, at the University of Sheffield and I gave you a probably 20 second tutorial on EBSD and I know that I don't have to give you a tutorial about optical metallography since the father of metallography was a Sheffield graduate. Um, so that's cool. It's very exciting for me. Um, all right, so we etch the sample and then what? Well, we take a DRM uh, measurement, a DRM data set. So here you actually see the real setup that we have in my lab, one of the setups that we have in my lab. And you realize that DRM relies on a very standard optical microscope. This is a stereo microscope. The other thing that you'll note here is this motorized stage, uh, the function of which is to drive a light source, uh, this one here. It's basically a flashlight. 
around the sample. The sample is sitting down here. You'll see it in a moment as I play the, the video. And as you rotate the light source, you're effectively changing the incoming light direction, right? And so you're imaging your sample. This is a live image of the nickel coin that I showed you before as you change the illumination direction. So let me just play the movie real quick. And so what you see is that these grains come to life, right? They start lighting up and reflecting light back into the microscope with different intensity as a function of the illumination angle. You look at this grain here first, it's very dark, and then at some point, at, you know, under some specific set of angles, it gets really bright and then dark again, and then eventually it will become bright again. So this, this is what we call directional reflectance, right? The, ref the reflectance, the reflection intensity depends on the incoming light direction, which we define as a pair of angles, phi and theta, the azimuth and the elevation angle. In this animation, I haven't showed you that the motorized stage can also change the um, elevation angle, but we vary both. We vary both and we collect a stack of micrographs, right? Um, up to, well, more than 1600 sometimes, depending a little bit on the angular resolution that you want to use. And all these micrographs show exactly the same thing in the sense that you're imaging the same sample that doesn't move. So you don't even have to register the micrographs. They're all registered automatically. But each micrograph is saved uh, as a function or with a tag that tells you what phi and theta coordinates you use for that particular micrograph. And then what we do is we compile the direction of reflectance information site specifically. So from an area uh, in your data set or maybe one grain in, the, in, the, in, you know, in your polycrystal uh, into these plots that we call directional reflectance profiles or DRPs, right? And that these DRPs basically, again, show specifically one, one certain grain, one certain pixel even in your micrograph or in, in your data set, how the reflection intensity changes as a function of phi and theta. Phi goes from zero to 360 degrees and theta goes from very shallow angles, something around 10 degrees, all the way up to about 70 degrees. We can go to 90 degrees because otherwise the flashlight will be obscuring your camera. You cannot get a picture of your sample. That's why these are donuts um, and not, you know, uh, whole plots. And the way you should read this is it's really like a heat map. So if you're looking at a specific grain from a set of angles uh, that is represented here with a reflectance peak, that particular grain will be very bright, meaning that light will be reflected back into the microscope. But of course, if you look at the same grain from a different area that is cooler, um, you won't see anything. And of course, we have all the different grain levels in between, right? So, DRPs are to DRM what diffraction patterns are to EBSD. In other words, we're using DRPs to index crystallographic orientation of grains. And I'll show you um, that concept in this slide here. So remember, I said that we have to etch the material. So this is again nickel after um, etching with marbles reagent. And what you find after etching is a very corrugated surface. So in this case, it shows a rooftop type of topography. And these are micro facets, right? So it turns out that um, marbles reagent gives a uh, surface topography with one, one, one type facets. So all these facets here actually follow the one, one, one crystallographic planes of the underlying crystal. But because of their size, they reflect light. Um, and so you can find specular reflection. So in this case here, for instance, you could imagine light being reflected along two different directions. So if you illuminate the sample from top, or in DRM, it's the opposite. If you come from these two specific angles, uh, these facets would reflect light back into the optical microscope, right? And that's visually depicted in this uh, Photoshop image here that shows a, a DRP in 3D around this topography. Different crystallographic, well, different crystal grains have different crystallographic orientation, which um, is something we all know. And it turns out, well, as a result of that, the surface crystallography will be different, right? Because we'll have a different number and, and arrangement of one one planes uh, at the surface of, of different grains, which means that when you etch the sample and you reveal these one one planes uh, or facets, uh, you have, you're gonna have a different topography in, in these grains. Uh, which means that these different grains will give you different DRPs, which you can appreciate in these in this, um, examples here. So 
that's all you need for DRM, right? We measure directional reflectance, we measure DRPs. We need to know what sort of surface topography on that particular material, that particular reagent is going to give us. And if we have all these the ingredients, uh, then we can measure crystallographic orientation indirectly from measurements of reflectance. So in other words, I can color code these DRPs according to the EBSD um, coding or, uh, you know, um, color scheme, right? There are many different ways that we have developed, or different algorithms that we have developed to index uh, these DRPs. So I'm not going to give you a list uh, um, or, or, you know, uh, a description of all these different algorithms. Actu actually, a couple of days ago, we published the last paper showing yet another algorithm. But they're all based, they're all based on the capability of identifying reflectance peaks, uh, identifying bands uh, that typically connect peaks, uh, understand or digitalize, so to speak, uh, how these peaks are uh, oriented in space, figure out how that translates into the surface topography, so what surface topography would give rise to that particular signal, and by knowing the crystallography of these facets, uh, there you go, you know the crystal orientation of the crystal, of the grain. Uh, but I gave you a figure about you know, the accuracy of this technique, and here is where the figure came from. So this is a histogram that shows the error that we make when we um, guess orientation by DRM um, with respect to a EBSD measurement. So we're using EBSD as a ground truth, then we register DRM, excuse me, and EBSD data set, and then pixel by pixel, or in this case, grain by grain, we compute what is the misorientation between the estimates and, um, and the measurements. And that's basically what we're plotting here. So you see this histogram uh, has a peak at about three degrees. That's where the figure that I gave you earlier comes from. But then there is a somewhat long shoulder, which says that uh, for some grains, uh, and specifically in this sample, those that you see highlighted here in hotter colors, uh, give you problems. Right? They, with the, the accuracy of the, of the um, algorithms we're using on these particular grains is not great. And it turns out that if you were to replot this data into an inverse pole figure to understand whether there is a specific orientation that gives you problems, so you'll, you'll see that it's the 111 in the nickel coin. Uh, and the reason for that, I don't know if you can actually tell, but you know, there is a little peak here. Uh, the reason for that is that the DRPs of grains in that particular orientation don't have a lot of signal and so don't have a lot of peaks so it's it's difficult to to understand what the corresponding surface topography and therefore the crystallographic orientation is and sometimes on these grains we actually um, because of the high symmetry of of the surface topography in this particular case uh, we have quite big errors uh, to calculate the in-plane orientation, not as much the out-of-plane orientation of the grains, uh, which is the one one but the rotation about the axis. All right, so I, I introduced DRM, but you know when I, did, when I gave you the introduction about DRM, I, I said two things. It, it could be really cool to use DRM to study additively manufactured metals and metal alloys, uh, but I haven't showed you that. Uh, I just showed a nickel, pure nickel coin. And then the other thing that I said is, uh, oh, uh, we can use DRM for, you know, to image, to characterize large area samples. But really, so far, I just showed you a nickel coin again that we also characterize by EBSD. So let me fix these two things and show you uh, this DRM measurement. This is on a silicon polycrystalline wafer. Uh, this is 15 by 15 centimeters. So it would be impossible to fit that into a scanning electron microscope. Actually, it's impossible to fit it into our DRM setup that I showed before, and we built a larger setup. Uh, I think this is something like one and a half meters uh, long. Um, instead of rotating the light source uh, and, and hurt some people in the lab, we rotate the uh, sample, but you know, the, the point is exactly the same as before. You see sparkling diamonds, uh, you see directional reflectance, uh, and sure enough, if you um, run this data set through the same algorithm we use for nickel, you get a, what I think is the largest orientation map ever recorded. But if you have seen something bigger, tell me and I'll stop making that statement. Um, the cool thing is that we actually use exactly the same algorithm we use for nickel because 
on silicon, we also find one on one facets. So the surface topography is the same. Crystallography is, is very similar. And so we can get orientation information uh, without even tweaking our algorithms. Now to the second point, alloys. So this is our Frankenstein sample, nickel uh, Inconel 718, produced by directed energy deposition, which we etched using um, Tallinn steel reagent. And we took a DRM data set of it, which is plain now. And so you see direction of reflectance, but you can already see that there are some differences. It's not as crisp as I showed you in nickel and in silicon, right? It's a little bit, well, it, it, is, it feels different. And the reason is that upon etching, we don't have these micro facets on the surface, but the direction of reflectance actually stems from the second phase precipitates that we reveal through, um, oh, that's a typo. It's not marbles etching, it's culling steel. Right, so that's not marbles etching. Uh, so culling steel actually reveals the second phase precipitates because they are nickel-3 niobium. They are rich in niobium. Niobium is corrosion resistant. So when you put your sample into the solution, the nickel matrix surrounding the precipitates will etch faster and these precipitates will protrude from the surface, giving rise to the directional reflectance. And this is just an exemplary DRP of this data set, which again, you can tell is different from what I showed you before. It's a little bit more confused, right? It's, it's, it's more, um, the signal is more convoluted. I don't know how else to explain it. It's not as crisp as before. We see some peaks, but uh, there is a lot of background noise and they're not as defined as what I showed you before. So uh, how do we go about indexing orientation in this nickel-based alloy? Well, uh, because of these differences that I just highlighted, we have to go back to the design board. So again, understand reflectance, uh, where it comes from, and whether there is a relationship between the crystallographic orientation of grains and the surface structure that we find. And so I'm going to walk you through that correlation or relationship uh, by focusing on this specific grain. This grain has a 100 axis sticking out of the page, and then a uh, 100 axis along X and another one along Y. So that's the crystal orientation of this grain. And so if you think about that, you'll realize that these precipitates, which are um, platelets, uh, referred to also as delta phase uh, in, in Cornell, uh, are aligned along the 0, 1, 1 crystallographic axis uh, of the underlying crystal. It turns out they're actually sitting on 1, 1, 1 planes. So they're intersecting the surface uh, of this grain along the 0, 1, 1, but they're actually sitting on 1, 1, 1 planes. So basically what I'm telling you here is the following. The direction of reflectance that we measure, the, the reflections that we see in our signal come from the platelets, uh, but indirectly, come from the 111 planes again. And to convince you that this is actually true, I have this fancy looking image where uh, you know, my, my um, researcher collected a bunch of different grain orientations or, or measure or assess the crystallographic orientation of a bunch of grains in this data set by EBSD and then plotted the corresponding DRPs. Now inside the DRPs you see this unit cells uh, which are the schematic representation of the corresponding crystal orientation in which we only show the 111 planes because I told you the platelets are sitting on 111 planes. And if you just look at, you know, simple correlations, uh, you'll see that uh, actually, are the, you know, those correlations are there. If you look at this uh, example, for instance, this is a, a crystal with a four-fold symmetry and you see four peaks, uh, although distributed in the, in the DRP. This is a Two-fold symmetry, we see two peaks. Uh, this, is a, this is a bit weird. This is a, a crystal with a three-fold symmetry, but we have six peaks. Uh, but then again, you, you think about platelets. These platelets are not like facets. Uh, you know, light can be reflected from both sides of each of the platelets. And so, you know, maybe that's the reason why we have six peaks and not three. Now, based on my rambling around describing these kind of relationships, you also understand that we don't know exactly how to analytically interpret these signals, right? That these are difficult to interpret. And so how do we analyze and how we de do we index orientation in this particular system? Well, we do what all material scientists do when they don't know how to connect A with B. They rely on machine learning, at least I do. Right? And so what we did here was, um, let me go back, to actually use this very same data set here to train a neural network, which we call EulerNet, 
because it predicts the three Euler angles described in crystal orientation in sample coordinate systems. And once the uh, network is trained, uh, you can fit in any DRP from another sample that was produced by DED, of course, in Kernel 718, so this is not material agnostic, right? Um, and then it's going to speed up a crystal orientation for you, or the three Euler angles, so, and produce the maps. So on this slide, I have EBSD maps and DRM maps, but I'm not telling you which one is which. Um, and I also have two sets of maps. I have the IPFZ, which shows orientation along the build direction, and IPFY, which is orientation along the axis coming out of the page, to show you that it's not texture measurements. These are three-dimensional orientation measurements. We understand, you know, we, we can characterize quite nicely the 3D orientation of crystals. So which one is which? Which one comes from DRM? Which one comes from EBSD? Any guesses? All right, so the top one is from the distance. Top one is no, it's from DRM. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I proved my point, right? <laughs> <laughs> These maps are very similar. Yeah. Um, and how often are you able to prove your point on that? Is it 50 50? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a good question. I never, I, I, I didn't keep track, but I think some people, well, you know what? Actually, it depends a little bit on the resolution of the projector that you're using. Because, of course, the DRM data set has a coarser resolution. So if you, if you think about that, you can see that this is a little bit more grainy compared to this one here. And so people guess, oh, DRM up, uh, ABSD, uh, bottom, top, bottom. But anyway, um, so this is the histogram corresponding to the accuracy of DRM of the Euler net in Inconel 718. It actually peaks around five degrees. So it's a bit worse than what I showed you before. Um, but I think the problem here is, is different in the sense that this is a microstructure. This is one of the Frankenstein samples that I showed you before. And as a result of, of being Frankenstein simple, you have a lot of small grains and a lot of big grains. And I think you know, when we're dealing with very small grains, especially during the stage where we have to register DRM and EBSD to train the Euler network, uh, the Euler net, uh, there might be some misalignment that induces some error or bias, uh, which I think is the reason why we are doing a little bit worse um, when it comes to um, to DRM on uh, on on Inconel 718. All right, so with that, I'll, I'll get to the conclusion of this first part. And uh, what I showed you is DRM is one of these uh, many, but it's the one that we are using, high throughput characterization techniques that I think is going to be very you know, helpful in characterizing microstructure heterogeneity in metal AM because uh, it's faster. It takes only 12 minutes with our custom-made equipment, which is really you know, uh, low tech, so to speak. So it can be improved, in my, in my opinion. Um, and it's regardless of sample size, provided that you can image the whole thing. It still takes 12 minutes. Uh, one thing I haven't told you is that it may take up to one hour to train the, the data set. And, and so training the data set is the pain point uh, of DRM at this point, because you need to uh, build a data a training set of, of the specific material you're interested in using the specific additive technology that you are interested in, right? And then once you have it, you need to do DRM and EBSD, and then you have to register the two things, and then you have to train the, so that's an involved process. But the cool thing is that once that's done, um, you can basically take any new uh, sample produced by DED, sample of that material produced by that particular additive process, and then be able to get an orientation map in 12 seconds. Um, so so that's, that's the beauty of it. And I think it's going to be very helpful for industry because industry typically sticks to one specific process and one specific material, right, to produce many parts. I'll uh, leave you with this final slide on DRM, uh, where we're going with it. So uh, I'm excited to say that we are in discussion with these two companies to uh, apply DRM to their proprietary alloys. Uh, if you have been thinking all along about titanium-based alloys, the answer is... It's going to come eventually, uh, not now though. And then the other thing that I want to say is, has anybody, has anybody worked or is working in collaboration with EDEX? Cool. Uh, so EDEX is one of the uh, manufacturers of EBSD systems. Um, and if you go to uh, the website, you will actually see these three images, uh, obviously photoshopped. 
And I, I like to have them here because, it, again, it, it shows the massive limitations of, I love EBSD, but you know, they're, they're all limitations when it comes to EBSD. One of them is large area characterization, which I showed you DRM can overcome to some extent. And the other one, which is extremely excited about, is that EBSD cannot be run on complex, uh, non-flat surfaces. But we're actually proving the point that we can do that with DRM. Um, except that I cannot share with you yet because it's not published and it's still in the making. But I can tell you, if you take my word for that, that DRM can handle curved surfaces. So with that, I'll go to the second part of my talk. And so here I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, microstructure architecture. So I'm going to talk about laser powder fusion processes or strategies that we have developed to control, to go from a chaotic microstructure heterogeneity, the Frankenstein sample, to something that we can build from the bottom up as if we were playing with Lego. Um, one slight introduction about LPBF, although maybe most of you already know what LPBF is all about, uh, but I'm particularly proud of this slide because this is a live footage of the uh, 3D printer that my PhD student at NTU built from scratch. So this is our actual machine, custom-made machine. Um, during LPBF, it's not playing. Sorry. All right. So during LPBF, you have this recorder arm that um, moves on the platform and spreads a thin layer of powders on the little platform and then you have this high power laser that strikes the powders and, and melts them where you want the material to be solid, right? That's LPDF. Uh, you can already tell from this video that there are a bunch of different things you can change during the process uh, such as power. I don't know if you can tell but some of these cross sections are a little bit brighter or the laser is a bit brighter because you're using, you know, higher power than others, like this one here, for instance. You can change velocity at which the laser scans many other things. But you can also change, as you can tell, the scan angle. And the scan angle is going to be important for what I'm going to tell you next. So if you were able to uh, uh, zoom in, and I cannot stop this video. All right, so this is going to be, a, all right, never mind. So if you, were, if, you, if you were able to zoom in and look at what happens during uh, the interaction between the laser and the powders, you would see something like this. This is the cross-section um, uh, schematics of the thin powder layer. The laser is coming along the X axis. This is the build direction. So the laser is, co is coming out in and out of the page, right? And as it scans into the screen, it creates this melt pool of liquid metal that rapidly solidifies following um, steep thermal gradients. These are typically tilted because of the shape of the melt pool. Um, and solidification occurs through the nucleation and growth of dendrites or cells, uh, which are in essence like ice crystals. Uh, this is not an ice crystal. This is a nice looking inconel crystal that we capture uh, with a polarizer. And so it looks like ice. Uh, but in essence, it's the same concept. Uh, after a while, everything is solid. Then the laser backs up on itself, coming out of the screen right now and producing another melt pool adjacent to the previous one. There's a little bit of overlap to avoid uh, unmelted powders. Uh, um, and then once you're done with one layer, the build platform lowers down by a few tens of microns. You spread a new layer of powders, uh, and then you repeat the process over and over again, layer after layer, to produce your three-dimensional part. This is the actual you know, optical micrograph of LPDF stainless steel 316L, which shows this fish scale structure, a uh, very prototypical. Now, I, I briefly showed you an EBSD map of the microstructure architectures that we can control. And to explain how we gain that kind of control, um, I need to uh, walk you through two main concepts or mechanisms, which I have listed here. So during LPBF or solidification in general, uh, cubic materials such as stainless steel 316L like to grow with crystals along the 100, with a 100 axis along the thermal gradient. So basically what that means is that if you look at the melt pool, all these dendrites are going to grow with a 100 axis uh, inward. But of course they can have a different crystallographic orientation about that axis, right? The second concept is that um, epitaxial growth during solidification is always favored over the nucleation of a new crystal. What that means is that if you were to take 
uh, liquid metal, put it in contact to solid metal, the liquid metal will grow following the crystallographic orientation of the solid metal underneath that acts as a, as a seed, as a template. Um, and it's a combination of these two mechanisms or laws, if you will, that allows us to control the crystal orientation of this material. And I'm going to try to walk you through that uh, by focusing on this single image here, so bear with me. So this image shows the overlap between two stacks of melpools that we have built on top of one another. At some point in time, you can imagine this melpool being liquid and basically solidifying on top of the solid adjacent melpool here. Now, following the second principle, that these dendrites uh, will want to grow on top of the crystallographic orientation, on top of the pre-existing solid dendrites, right? However, they will want to do so only for those dendrites that have a 100 axis parallel to the new thermal gradient to the right. And because we keep switching thermal gradient direction left, right, left, right, we're basically selecting one single crystallographic orientation that can epitaxially grow through multiple layers. That is schematically shown here. This orientation has a 100 axis to the right, 100 axis to the left. So if what I'm telling you is true, basically we can build single crystals by keeping the laser scan direction always constant because we need to stack melpools on top of one another, right? Which is exactly what you find here. So this is not a single crystal, it's a quasi-single crystal, it's not perfect, um, of one by one by two centimeters of stainless steel, which we built using this strategy. And again, if you look at the color coding, of EVSD, you see that most of the material here is green. Green is 101. It actually fits along the z-axis, the field direction, actually fits with our model here. And if you look at X, right, X is the laser scan direction in and out of the page. Most of the material is red. Red is 100. That again fits with our model. I have a couple of slides at the end of this, present, of this final session where I'll talk about this heterogeneity. Uh, where we have some sort of, uh, uh, how can I say this, um, consistent error, let's say. So I'll come back to that later. For now, let's think about quasi-single crystal. So if we, if we keep the laser scan direction constant, we can make a quasi-single crystal, which means that if we were to vary the laser scan direction every now and then, we should be able to make a quasi-polycrystal or a meta-polycrystal, if you want, which is exactly what you can see here. Right, so this is a stack of different blocks of quasi-single crystal with different crystallographic orientation, which we built by changing you know, from one block to the next, uh, the laser scan direction. In this particular case, we're keeping the uh, laser direction constant uh, for 50 layers to build these bricks. We call this layer-wise engineering of grain orientation, which is a bit of a mouthful, but um, I like the acronym that comes out of it. Um, so you can look at these three pole figures uh, to convince yourself that you're actually looking at um, quasi-single crystal. These are very strongly biaxially textured uh, materials. Um, and again, in this case, we kept the laser scan direction constant for 50 layers, but there is no rule about that. We can vary the laser scan direction more frequently, for instance, every layer. And if, we, if you do that, and if you just vary the laser scan angle by one degree, you create this, which we refer to as a helicoidal microstructure. So this is a crystal, as you can see from this animation, that keeps rotating about the z-axis along, uh, you know, as layer after layer. Um, and it's something you cannot possibly find in nature. This is something that can only be done by additive manufacturing with this kind of level of, of microstructure control. Um, this is the actual measurement it's an animated GIF made of all the uh, pole figures uh, that my postdoc acquired layer after layer. And again, it shows a um, fixed 110 axis parallel to the Z or the build direction. And then all the other poles uh, in the three pole figures rotate about that axis. There is also no reason why we should only change the laser scan direction from one layer to the next. We can change the laser scan direction within the layer and create microstructures with more complex shapes. Note this, these are not parts with complex shape, these are microstructures with complex shape. So it's a bit of a different um, concept in additive manufacturing. 
Okay, now um, I think I owe you those um, some 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 information about that microstructure. This is a talk about microstructure heterogeneity, and in Lego, the microstructure heterogeneity is these lamellae that you can see here with a different orientation. Uh, and so we, we investigated a little bit about that to try to understand what's going on because we care about microstructure heterogeneity. So this is a high-res EVSD map of, of one of those, uh, actually three of those lamellae. And if you were to look at the corresponding uh, surface after etching under the uh, scanning electron microscope, you see something like this. And you quickly realize that these grains are growing epitaxially along the z-axis at the center of the melt pool. So we call these the center line grains. And we're not the only ones that have reported this growth. People have published papers talking about the mechanisms behind the formation of the center line growth. So this is one that is quite popular, I think. And they basically attribute the presence or lack of center line grains to the melt pool. So if you are printing or if you're using process parameters that give you a conduction mode or like a shallow melt pool shape, uh, because at the bottom, the, the tip of the melt pool has a large, relatively large radius of curvature, the thermal gradient here, which is typically parallel to the melt pool boundary, is going to be, um, sorry, perpendicular to the melt pool boundary, is going to be parallel to the z-axis, and so driving the growth of 100 grains. By contrast, if you are printing uh, in keyhole mode, so with much deeper melt pools with a smaller tip of uh, uh, radius of curvature at the end of them, um, the lateral thermal gradients, uh, basically, or the lateral growth, pinches off uh, the center line so you don't see them anymore. Except that at NTU, in my group, we kind of disproved that because uh, we came up with this set of experiments uh, where we can trigger on and off center lines regardless of melt pool shape. So that suggests that melt pool shape is not the main factor governing the center line growth. And um, those are the corresponding uh, EBSD maps uh, to you know, make sure that these are indeed center line grains. And you can find them in keyhole mode and you can find them in conduction uh, mode. Um, what we think is happening here is different. We think that when you, um, when you process, when you run an LPBF process, uh, but you, know, you add some delays between one line, one scan track, and the other one, you basically let the material cool down. Um, and so that creates a thermal gradient um, along the z-axis that is much stronger. And that's when you can actually see center lines forming. By contrast, if you produce uh, your block of steel using much faster deposition rate or, or you know, processing rate, uh, um, you have thermal buildup. And as a result of that, the thermal environment surrounding the melt pool is not as um, you know, abrupt, let's say, as, as this case here. So the, the lateral growth uh, is comparable to the one that you have um, here at the center, and eventually you, because you're not growing epitaxially, one, one melt pool to the next, uh, it kills the, the center line growth. So these are just experiments. We're running simulations to, to um, prove the point, uh, but um, I think they're quite convincing, at least to me. All right, so with that, let me go to the conclusions of the second and last part of my talk. Um, so I showed you LEGO. LEGO is a uh, AM strategy that we have developed. We have developed many others um, that I don't have the time to, to go through today. Um, I, I decided to talk about this because, well, I like the LEGO idea, um, but I also like the fact that there is some heterogeneity in that microstructure control, and my talk is about microstructure heterogeneity. Um, so the last point is something that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, so these strategies basically give you the possibility of, of leveraging microstructure heterogeneity and in, in incorporate that additional level of, of degree in the design of materials, which is really where I think AM will be evolving towards. Right? Not only we can, do, we can use AM to make complex shapes, we can also use AM to make complex microstructures or parts that integrate these similar microstructures together. And the rationale for doing that is that different microstructures will have different functionality. So you can come up with multifunctional parts where the distribution of these different microstructures is going to be dictated by you know, where within the part uh, 
they are going to best suit the constraints imposed by the application, for instance, right? Um, so this whole idea is, is not new. People have been working on mesostructure optimization for, for, for a few years. We're collaborating with some of these people, especially Virginia Tech, where they're using some sort of topology optimization applied to microstructures to understand exactly how to distribute these different microstructures within the solid based on their functionality and as a function or, or based on the um, constraints of the application, imposed by the application that you're interested in. Um, we're also looking at the mechanical properties of these complex microstructures that I presented to you, the Lego microstructures. We're finding interesting results, but I don't have the time to go through them. Instead, I want to just spend one more slide to talk about unconventional applications of these strategies. And one of these unconventional applications is this one here. So here we've used Lego to encode a QR code in a block of steel. If you take out your mobile phone and try to scan that, you will be redirected to my group website. Um, the fun fact about this is that this block, which I have here, so if you wanna, after the talk, wanna come and have a look at the, at the, at the live image, which is basically this one here, um, you, can, you can come here and, and check it out. The fun fact is that this is way too big to run eBSD on, and so we use DRM instead. So that's a DRM uh, orientation map that assigns colors according to the um, EBSD color scheme um, as a function of the crystal orientation of stainless steel 316L. This is a barcode that encodes the number 11. At the time of this work, uh, NT was ranked number 11 worldwide. And so we figured out uh, 11 is uh, something simple to encode in a, in a block of steel. Not only we can encode information that can be read by a computer, we can also encode information that can be appreciated by human beings. And that's a nice collaboration that we had with a Singaporean artist, uh, Lakshmi Mohan Babu. She comes up with these designs, many of these designs, which um, represent the diversity of mankind brought together under a unifying symbol. And our contribution to her vision or mission was to reproduce these designs using a material, using the microstructure. And so we use our Lego strategy to make these blocks of um, stainless steel, again. Uh, here you have two grains with complementary shape and different crystallographic orientation that we 3D printed uh, using Lego. The fun fact about this is that this block has been selected by the Moon Gallery folks, uh, an organization in the Netherlands, uh, that uh, collects pieces of art from all over the world and then sends them to the moon. So this block is going to go to the moon in 2025, um, not on Mars with the Perseverance rover, but to the moon, which is still pretty cool in my opinion. Um, uh, and right now it's on the International Space Station, in fact, as a test flight. Um, right, so that brings me to the end of my, my presentation. Here I have a black and white version of the QR code because I'm told that some new, uh, older versions of, of smartphones cannot read colors, and so, but that's exactly the same thing that I showed you before, just different colors, and this is a nice picture of the pre-COVID group retreat that I had with my group in Malaysia. Everybody was very happy at the time. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Um, has anyone got any questions? Or is everyone shocked into silence? <coughs> All the amazing work that's going on. Uh, I've got one that's related to my work, um, in particular data management. Um, obviously DRM, if you're taking 1600 images per scan, you need a fair bit of storage, especially if you're doing multiple samples. Yeah. Um, is that something that can be scaled down later on in that processing as you're going through the DRPs? Correct. We're, that's exactly what we're doing. We're dumping all the optical micrographs and we're just saving the RPs, which is more manageable. Uh, some of the most rec recent approaches that we're using to index orientation also rely on autoencoders, mm -hmm. uh, which basically reduce the dimensionality of the DRPs. And we do it not for data storage. Um, the rationale is not minimizing data storage, but more of maximizing um, the um, data analysis because it's lower dimensionality. But we get you know, similar results, and so we're happy to go with that. Yeah. So that's, that's our strategies of okay. Just coming back to the fact that you said that this is faster, and I agree it's faster than EBSD. There's no, there's no question about 
I love EBSD. Right. I'm not saying that EBSD is bad either. What I'm trying to come from is, is from, the, from the industry standpoint. Yeah. When an industry makes something, it's, it's all about getting the parameters correct to make that part, and then, generally speaking, you keep and you carry on making that part. So I'm trying to find out where this fits, because if you're going to make a part in industry, and you can spend quite a bit of time making that part, you spend quite a bit of time So it's not a, a technique that speeds up. There's a, there's a sort of, I can see where it would fit, but it's not a technique that you're going to keep using on that same part because that part's already been made, it's off, it's in production. So which bit are you, is it for industries that are going to produce lots of different kinds of parts that are very similar? And you want to check that those parts that are very similar are going to manage the job because obviously it's not, it's only going to work in the, in the early development So I, I have different answers to that to that comment. Thank you, first of all. That, that's a very valid point. Um, now, the way industry does things when it comes to additive manufacturing is not necessarily the best way moving forward. Like spending all the time and the efforts in figuring out exactly how to make that part looking exactly the same, even at the microstructure level, as the other one, um, but using a specific batch of powders that I cannot change, and if the vendor goes bankrupt, I'm screwed. Um, using that particular machine, not only the vendor, but that particular machine that we have downstairs in the, in the basement, uh, and I don't want anybody else to touch it, uh, and using that particular alloy. So, you know, these are very specific um, um, activities, uh, let's say, right? They are aimed, like the Mars rover uh, parts, uh, they, they had to produce one, and so they invested all those efforts because they had the money to do it, right? But moving forward, if you want additive to be more readily adopted by other companies, other industries, so that's not a paradigm that I think is sustainable. And so that's where DRM can help. And it could help uh, in different ways. It could help uh, at the early stage, as you were saying, you know, when we have to figure out what is the best uh, combination of process parameters that we want to make for that particular build, because anyway, there's a lot of try and error, and so DRM can help with that. It can also help more downstream when you have, when you want to produce multiple parts, and you're not quite sure whether this microstructure heterogeneity uh, that I showed you here, right, uh, is going to, if whether or not you have to handle. You know, these are not identical, again producing one single run using the same process parameters, and yet. So, so there are different ways, I think, where a CDRM um, potentially playing a role in, in industry. No, I like the idea of uh, being able to improve something on a new machine. Right. <coughs> and, in a, and in a new building and a new setup. Right. The difference between the atmospheres in uh, Singapore and the UK, for example. For instance. Yeah, Pro thanks, yeah. So provided you're using the same etching on that particular material, there is of course under etching and over etching and that's gonna mess up the indexing. But, and I think that's what you're getting to with your question, the, the processing window is not that narrow, right? You, you know, qualitatively speaking, you put your sample in, you see directional reflectance, you take it out and you do DRM and that's good enough. So it's, it's, it's robust, especially the latest, I mean, the, the last paper that I just briefly mentioned during my presentation that came out just a couple of days ago has some preliminary study about this, how robust the algorithms are to under etching and over etching. Not only that, but also, I mean, you could ask the same question about equipment. What happens if I use a different microscope, a different light source, right? So it's, of course, it's still early stage in the sense that we have three setups uh, and they work, uh, but it's just three setups, right? Uh, maybe through more collaborations down the road, uh, we can expand our knowledge about how sensitive this technique is to the variability, the intrinsic variability. Um, but for now, it looks promising.
um, when you put string into dissertation, yeah. and stuff, it starts messing up the resolution of targets. This is very difficult in BSD. So, right, so that's something else that we are hoping to be able to do uh, in C2 mechanical tests in conjunction with DRM, especially because, uh, again, the, uh, the more macroscopic uh, effect of, uh, of microstructure on mechanical properties. And I have, a, you know, we have some, again, preliminary results, uh, which are already published in one of the early papers on DRM, that actually shows that if you were to strain your, um, your material and then etch afterwards, uh, you would be able to pick up uh, in, even intragranular um, misorientations. Right. And is there anything to stop you etching before you strain it with an input chip? Sorry? Is there anything to stop you etching the sample prior to uh, testing? Just equipment as of now, because I don't have, I don't know how to do it. But I don't think so. The thing is, you know, uh, that's another interesting question that I have, but I don't have enough people working on the yeah. in my team. In my team is, you know, what happens if, um, if you etch and then strain? I mean, clearly the surface topography is going to be different. Uh, we start seeing, you know, very simply put, sleep bands coming out, right? Um, uh, and they obviously contribute to directional reflectance, but that's something you can quantify, you can measure. So how are you going to interpret that? Uh, can, you, can that provide additional information um, during the mechanical deformation uh, or, you know, on plasticity in general? So I, I don't have a PhD student working on that right yet. And how do you keep track of your reference axis, like x, y, and z? Because you mentioned your sample was rotating. Uh -huh. And then when you need to plot an IPS, you need to know if you want to plot IPS. Right. So in this case here, nope. In this case here, the sample doesn't rotate. So uh, the lab reference system is fixed, right? Because uh, the light source rotates. Okay. So then, it, you know, if you want to compare this to EBSD, you just have to make sure that you know you have some marks and you know how to orient your sample inside the scanning electron microscope. But then you can compare directly. In this case here. Um, it's different because we are rotating the silicon wafer in this case, but then we are controlling the rotation, so we know exactly by how much to rotate back the optical micrograph, uh, and so effectively have the same data set that I showed you for the nickel coin. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Got one. I've got. Oh, go on. Uh, just what you mentioned about um, using DRM on curved surfaces. Yes. So, uh, polish, no. Etch, yes. We don't need to polish. That's another thing that I like about that. We don't need to mirror, to have a mirror finish on the surface. In fact, what we're doing now is we're using turbine blades. And we're, we're taking the turbine blade as it comes out uh, of production, maybe some after some black, if they strip off the, uh, uh, the coatings, the thermal barrier coatings, so you have a surface that is clearly not polished. And then we just dump the whole thing in acid and, uh, and take your own. Uh, go on. That's interesting that you just said that because it's made me think, ooh, right, so you don't have to polish it. No. Um, it would link quite nicely its RAS, surface resonance acoustic spectroscopy. Yeah. So that doesn't, that does, you know, curved surfaces really nicely. But you tend to have to calibrate it against something, so they do. EBSD to calibrate straps. Now, if you've got pre-calibrated, so if, if you understand how this works, then of course you don't have to do that. And you're suddenly speeding up a large scale yeah. technology. Yeah. And our friends at Darwin would definitely be interested in that. Mm -hmm. So um, we, should have a, we should have a chat to see if we can get the input of someone like Ian. One last one, which I hope is a friendly question. <laughs> um, but I think, I think we discussed it on our first online meeting anyway. Um, there's been a few other researchers around the world that have attempted similar things to DRM with polarised lights. Yeah. Um, 
uh, it's quite, quite an open question as to can you sort of comment as to how DRM compares to those other yeah. attempts? So the first thing I'll say is that we're doing some version of DRM with polarized light. Uh, and maybe I can give you some more details about that, but it's not published yet. Um, but yeah, so polarized light is, is, I think, for people is even more immediate as an approach because we've been doing quite a bit of optical metallography using polarized light. And you don't have things to move. So on the one hand, it's, it's more, you know, it sounds like it's simpler. But, but the limitations with uh, um, approaches that are trying to get orientation information using polarized light there are a couple. So the first one is that, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't found any anybody showing 3D orientation. They can measure texture, but not the orientation in 3D uh, of the crystals, which is something we can do with the urn. And the other thing is that we typically need a optically anisotropic metal. Um, not even talking about metal alloys, because again, I haven't seen results on metal alloys. But even just thinking about pure metals, uh, you need you need the metal to be optically anisotropic, otherwise, after you polish it to a mirror-like surface, uh, to a mirror-like quality, uh, you're not going to see anything. It's just a mirror. So those are two limitations, uh, which basically means that you know, for some specific materials, uh, polarized light methods are going to be better, or maybe more easier, or, or more cost-effective, or whatever. And then for the others, you can use the urine. Okay, unless there's any more questions, we need thank Matteo in the customer room for its work. Thank you, guys. Thanks. So, we do have some lunch down in the Turner Museum.